Good evening and welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker. You know, it's become a tradition this time of year to do an hour-long edition of our show featuring the season's best Incredible Idaho stories. Joining us tonight for this special edition is the show's original host, Jack Hemingway. Jack, welcome back, and how's retirement treating you? I know you're doing a lot of hunting and fishing and traveling this great state. Well, I'll tell you, it's the greatest place in the world to retire, and you can't beat it for a place to learn about wildlife. And that's right, and for this year's Best of Incredible Idaho program, we've chosen some stories that profile some of the more unusual creatures that share our state. From wolverines to mountain lions, we enjoy a remarkably diverse wildlife heritage and it's a heritage that can elicit the full gamut of human emotions. From the unreasonable fear at the sight of a rattlesnake to a sense of awe at the majesty of a bighorn ram, our first story tonight captures the inherent grace and dignity of those bighorn rams and the rugged, spectacular country that is their home and refuge. It's been called the river of no return, a romanticized, but exceedingly appropriate name for Idaho's majestic Salmon River. Surrounded by sheer, unyielding canyon walls, the water has carved a tortuous path through the ranges of the northern Rocky Mountains, leaving behind a landscape wondrous in its purity and unbending magnificence. Here, in this imposing, primitive country, we're indisputably reminded that man is still subject to the whims and nuances of a powerful force called nature. She has sculpted a place of protection. Harsh, angular cliffs rise abruptly from the edges of the riverbank, forming a natural refuge for the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. They like open country without a lot of timber on it. They like fairly dry country. They can't handle deep snow. And steep slopes like this shed snow pretty easily. You don't get a real steep, uh, deep snow built up on them. Early winter is the breeding season for bighorn sheep. The females tend to band together in groups, some with this year's offspring by their side. Although the young lambs have been weaned, they still cling to the protection of their mothers. But the rams are on the move, traveling from band to band, up to 25 miles in a couple of days, looking for a receptive ewes. Unlike bull elk, bighorn rams do not form and protect a harem. Rather, they choose an individual ewe in a group and begin herding her, guarding her from the attentions of other would-be suitors. What's happening with this group of sheep here is we've got one mature ram and a couple of young rams that, are, that he's able to keep on the periphery just by, by threatening him a little bit. If you watch him, he'll stretch his neck out and turn his head from side to side and show him his horns and make a little bit of a mock chase, but really it doesn't take any significant effort to to keep the other rams away from her. The younger rams are probably two to three years old. They have yet to develop the massive full curl horns of an older male. A closer look reveals a series of rings circling the horn. Each winter, horn growth temporarily halts and a ring is formed much like those on a tree, making it possible to estimate the age of the animal. This dignified fellow carries horns that have acquired the mass and length of a ram approximately five or six years old. Oh, sure, they're heavy. You know, I, mature ram head is probably 40, 45 pounds. It's a lot of weight to carry around. Tremendous neck muscles on them. Yeah. Like I say, they're built to take the shock of running into things. If we had a couple of rams here that were of say comparable size, then you'd start to see some head banging and, and some real serious physical clashes. Often the end of a mature ram's horns are ragged and broken. This is called brooming. Although it seems this could possibly be caused by clashing with other males, it's much more likely it's a natural result of negotiating the rough rocky country that bighorns inhabit. I think it's probably just from beating them on rocks and trees and things like that, but, but they'll broom the ends off on almost all of them. So they'll take off, oh, six, eight inches worth of horn, usually. The horns of the female sheep grow each year, too, but average only about seven to nine inches. If she breeds this year, her lamb will be born sometime in late April or early May. Generally, when you look at a sheep herd, if you had, uh, say, 50 lambs for every 100 ewes, that's doing pretty well. Now, some of those ewes will be young ones, and they wouldn't be producing a lamb anyway, but, 
probably a good healthy sheep population, three years out of four, a ewe would produce a lamb. This population of bighorn sheep has not always been the healthy herd you see here today. During the winter of 88-89, biologists discovered that a lung disease was plaguing the animals, causing them to cough and show other signs of pneumonia. We don't know the whole story yet. Uh, we had uh, initial disease problem, and we lost a lot of adults in this population, maybe 40% of the adults and almost all the lambs. Uh, since then, we haven't had adult losses, but we've had a lot of lamb losses year after year. Uh, last year, it looked like things were improving a little bit, and it appears that they're getting better again this year. We had a wet spring, tremendous forage growth. It's been a great year. And so the sheep we're seeing on the mountain now look great. They're fat, they're sleek, they look real good. Although mountain lions have been known to prey on the lambs and ewes, few predators will challenge an adult ram. He need only fear disease, hunters, perhaps a bad fall in a rock slide, or poor habitat conditions. As is the case with many wild animals, the quality of the summer forage is a critical key to winter survival. Probably the, the absolute maximum for a ram would be 15 years. Uh, we see very few rams that, that get to 12 or 13 years. Uh, even 10 years is getting old for a ram. Of course, they're out there now running around on the hillside burning off all the body fat, you know, that they put on all summer long. And winter's coming. So uh, chances are they're not going to do nearly as well as the ewes are. The rams are on the run trying to provoke a response from a receptive view. What very often will happen is the ram will go up and just give her a leg strike with one of his front legs and stimulate a chase, and they'll chase each other all over the hillside until one of them gets tired. You know, sometimes the ewe will stimulate the chase herself. She'll initiate it, chase him around. The ewe also has the option of rejection. She may rebuff a younger ram in favor of a mature male or perhaps she's just not ready to be bred. And so the pageantry plays on against the spectacular backdrop carved by the river of no return. For centuries, secluded and spectral, the steep canyon walls have been silent witnesses, echoing with the crash of a thousand generations of rams fighting for the right to be a part of the next generation. They're neat animals. Man, I just, I never get tired of seeing them in a tree. Our next profile is of a very secretive animal that lives on the edges of our world. Although seldom seen, the mountain lion ranges our entire state from the Panhandle to the Owyhee Desert country. A creature this reclusive is a tough subject for scientific study, but patience, perseverance, and a shot of stubborn endurance eventually pay off. It's dawn. The sun barely peaks over the lip of the mountain, lending a bit of warm amber to the cool colors of the winter morning. The high desert country is eerily silent, as off in the distance the snow-covered ridges gradually brighten in the early morning light. It's during these shoulder hours of dawn and dusk that the mountain lion is most active. And the scientists and the houndsmen who track these elusive creatures must learn to adapt to the habits of the hunted. So that cat is either either in between where I saw where they crossed on these knobs or he's went there up into the lake. Yeah. What's the snow like over there? Can we follow the track? <clears throat> you can until you get on these south slopes. They look for marks like this, a signature imprinted in the snow, and a warning to all that a mountain lion has recently passed this way. If he stayed on this side, we'd be in good shape. Houndsman Ken Jaffick has been part of this research project since 1985. Good day. But he brings a backlog of tracking experience to the job and a delightful appreciation for Idaho's outdoors. Yeah, I've been following these old cats around these mountains for a lot of years. And uh, it's, a, it's a great sport. Gives you lots of exercise. And... Uh, out in the clear blue sky like today, it's a beautiful day. You won't find a better one in southern Idaho than what today is. The snowmobile roars off down the trail following the mountain lion tracks. If they prove to be fresh, then the chase will begin. The hounds bellow with excitement. 
Tracking dogs like these are essentially the only way biologists have of chasing and capturing a cougar. If the dogs can manage to pursue the mountain lion until it finally finds refuge in a tree, the researchers will be able to drug the animal and then fit it with a radio collar. But the snowmobiler returns to report that the tracks are too old and the chase is abandoned. It's a typical day on the study. Hope and defeat, load and unload, hurry up and wait. Today they're looking for Roxanne, an adult female cat that has been captured before. The signal from her radio transmitter is weak and the collar needs replacing. Most mountain lion studies have been conducted in wilderness or remote areas where man has had very little impact. The scope of this study is to determine how the cats fare in what scientists call a fragmented habitat. Here in the study area, the craggy peaks of the mountain ridges are separated by wide valleys. And in these mountains lie small towns and farms connected by a major interstate highway. We expect mountain lions to thrive in wilderness, but how well do they survive here? And what can we do to assure that they will continue to survive into the next century as man encroaches further on these remote areas? Dr. John Landre hopes that the data collected from this study will help biologists develop a land management plan that will balance the needs of the mountain lion with those of an expanding human population. Got the radio, uh, I got the guns, got the drugs, collars. Okay, we need someone to take the scale. Their luck has changed. Fresh tracks have been spotted, and the houndsmen and their dogs are hot on the trail. Okay, I'm gonna start heading up. It's a south-facing ridge, steep and slippery with the wet snow, and it doesn't take long before the climbers are breathless with exertion. We'll just sort of wait here and, and get the tracks headed to the east, Ken. Now it's turning and going up now. Okay, we'll just we'll keep going up. It's always easier going down. Eventually, they reach the base of the cliff only to discover that the cat has eluded the houndsman and is headed up another draw. The chase goes on and on, and the capture crew follows faithfully. They hike over the ridge and begin to trudge across a vast snow field, following the tracks of the houndsman and their dogs. The, the straight up and down the mountain the first couple of days was a bit much, but I'm, uh, I'm getting used to the altitude now. Joy Pierce, like most of the crew, is a member of an environmental organization called Earthwatch. Along with Idaho State University, it is one of the main sources of funding for this study. In addition, Earthwatch members contribute their time, coming in from all over the world to spend a week as a member of the capture team. Have you seen a mountain lion yet? Did you, were you with Oh them? yeah, yeah, we've, we've caught three. Was it worth it? Oh yes. <laughs> Joy will soon add a fourth cat to her count. The houndsman radioed that the dogs have caught up with their quarry and the cougar has taken refuge in a tall pine. Okay, well, I'm going to head over that way and get on that ridge so we can hear you. She's a beauty. She stares down from high among the pine boughs at the bellowing dogs, straining and leaping in frenzied excitement. Her right side is exposed, and John takes advantage. Got her! He shoots a dart that contains an immobilizing and tranquilizing drug, hitting her perfectly in the hip. John begins to climb the tree. Yeah, you want to get up there fast enough um, so it doesn't fall out of the tree. Um, but you don't want to get up there too fast because it'll, <laughs> it won't let you put a rope around its foot. Hey there. Hi, Roxy. How you doing? It's the adult female, Roxanne, that John was hoping to capture. But she, in turn, seems less than pleased at the idea of becoming reacquainted with John. John struggles with the rope, trying to place it around her foot. It's needed to ease her to the ground as the drug takes effect. But the cougar is not cooperating. I got it started. We'll see what happens here. Suddenly, she releases her hold. She slides gently through the branches, dangling by her left rear foot until she reaches the ground. Doing good, John. Give her another shot. I got her yet. The mountain lion is frustrated and tries to lunge away from her captors. 
Eventually, one of the houndsmen manages to get another rope on her, and she's safely injected with a second shot of the tranquilizer. She gradually calms as the drug begins to take effect. In the final few minutes before she's completely down, she bobs her head, looking about her with an unfocused stare. Finally, she slumps forward, and she's carried into the sun to be processed. Uh, one of these wrenches should work on that collar. Okay. That one? Her old collar will be replaced with a new one, and she'll be measured, weighed, and treated with an antibiotic. 75 inches. What a picture. Since Roxanne has been captured before, it's not necessary for the biologist to draw blood again. One aspect of this study okay, is to run a DNA analysis of the blood. This determines the genetic makeup of each cat. Eventually, scientists hope to be able to unravel the complex family relationships of the mountain lion population in this area. Infanticide seems to be fairly well documented uh, in a lot of predators, uh, most of felids, felids being cats. In the African lion, it seems to be a, an evolutionary strategy by males that take over a pride. In this area, um, we've documented males killing young ones. The question is, are they killing their own offspring or kittens sired by other males? And is this a tactic to bring the mother of the kittens into heat sooner so the male can pass on his genetic code to the next generation? In time, John hopes the data collected here will help answer these questions. For the more we learn about our wildlife world, the better neighbors we will be. And down the road, our grandchildren will thank us, for they too will have the satisfaction of knowing that somewhere out there, the magnificent mountain lion still silently stalks the ridge lines of Idaho. I have to be po totally honest, it's kicking the butt research. You know, we, we're doing serious work out here, but it's fun. And it's, um, they're just, they're neat animals. Man, they're just, I never get tired of seeing them in the tree. The bone-chilling sound of a spooked rattlesnake has evoked fear and aggression for this little understood creature for eons. Why are folks so afraid of them? Like so many fears, it probably is founded in ignorance. Perhaps with a greater understanding of the creatures, people will begin to move from terror to tolerance. The wanton shooting of rattlesnakes is deeply embedded in our culture. A number of southern states hold rattlesnake roundups every year as a big-time family and tourism event. Thank goodness for the Sweetwater Rattlesnake Roundup. It increases the people coming into our community. These people, in turn, increase all the retailers' business. From the time that man, that there's records of man on Earth, man has used animals for his own benefit. And I really feel that we're trying, or at least there's a portion of the people, trying to do away with something that ha is natural and have been natural for millions of years. Stop the slaughter now! Stop the slaughter now! Rattlesnake roundups have never been held in Idaho, but the notion that the only good rattlesnake is a dead one has ruled for years. Since the white man came to Idaho in the 1800s, it's been common practice for people to shoot rattlesnakes at will. Rick Baker, a native Idahoan, remembers killing snakes as a kid. I can remember the first time I ran into one, it was kind of like a super shot of adrenaline. Your feet defy gravity, and you're in the air, and you're shooting or kicking or stoning or clubbing the thing because you're scared to death of it. Um, I, I don't know where it came from. I think my grandfather used to tell stories about uh, snakes that were huge, as big as your leg, and could eat you, and about an old boy that uh, bought a pair of boots who some, uh, someone else had worn and who died from a rattlesnake bite and a piece of the fang was in the heel of the boot and he wore them and he died. So the, 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 the age of innocence and my naivete as a kid, boy, I'd see a rattlesnake and it, it pretty much uh, uh, immediate hunter-killer reaction, get rid of that booger. That kind of attitude handed down from generation to generation is hard to overcome. 
But it turns out that many people who actually get bitten by rattlesnakes are the same people who try to kill them or mess around with them in some manner. Now what we're seeing is young males slightly intoxicated that have been handling snakes. They're either out along a drainage ditch or along the river or up in the hills, see a rattlesnake, they chase it, they catch it, they pick it up, or they kill it and they think it's dead and then when they take a hold of it, it bites them. Dr. Blackman suggests that the best thing to do is avoid rattlesnakes and you won't get bitten. And for, for the most part, the rattlesnakes here are not aggressive rattlesnakes. Uh, there's a, a misperception that we have diamondbacks in Idaho. We don't. Uh, and you almost have to step on it before you get bit by it. And it's only purely defensive. These are not aggressive animals. Vince Cobb, a research wildlife biologist for Idaho State University, wholeheartedly agrees. Cobb has been studying the Great Basin rattlesnake at the Idaho National Engineering Laboratory for the last five years. During that time, he's handled over 565 rattlesnakes, and he's never been bitten once. The rattlesnakes really aren't an aggressive animal at all. That they're, uh, they try to stay hidden, and uh, most of the times when uh, you come up on a rattlesnake, they'll rattle and then just try to escape. Uh, sometimes they'll just stay cold and hidden in the tuft of grass or under the sagebrush or under a rock wherever they are in hopes that you'll just pass right by them. In the course of his research, Cobb has discovered a number of interesting things about rattlesnakes. For instance, he has found that female rattlesnakes give birth only once every three years. And that's if conditions are just perfect. If uh, someone comes in and eradicates many individuals, individuals from um, this den, and they happen to be a large number of females that were, say, pregnant that were killed, and you can imagine the effect that could have on the population, especially uh, if you have several years of this. In other states, Cobb says, that whole rattlesnake dens have been wiped out with dynamite or gasoline fires. This could have an impact on the overall ecosystem and food chain. All animals seem to, to serve a good purpose, and uh, the snakes are a very uh, important one. They're a, a top carnivore. They uh, primarily, uh, the rattlesnakes anyway, primarily feed on uh, small mammals. And, uh, you know, I could imagine if you um, eradicated a lot of snakes from a specific area that had a, a good number of small mammals, then uh, the population of the small mammals could increase. So as Vince Cobb suggests, the Great Basin Rattlesnake plays an important role in the balance of nature and that's why people like Cobb ask people to think twice about shooting rattlesnakes at will. After realizing that Great Basin rattlesnakes are more passive than aggressive, Rick Baker doesn't shoot them anymore. Well, I started hanging around some environmentalists. and began to get, make me realize that just because it was crawling or walking on the ground, I didn't need to be shooting at it. Um, it was a good lesson. Really, the rattlesnake, there's no, nothing to really be afraid of unless you're right on top of him and he's going to bite you. Uh, even then, I've seen times where I've been just inches away from a snake and, and uh, the snake's coiled and ready to go and all you got to do is sidestep and you're out of their way. If you do somehow get bitten by a rattlesnake, Dr. Blackman has the following advice. What you need to do when you're bitten by a rattlesnake is to first of all get away from the snake because it can bite a second time. Don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out what kind of a snake it was. Basically, you immobilize the arm right below the heart, uh, and you head for a medical facility, because it, it's a matter of minutes to hours when you get sick, and you get very sick. And you get very nauseated, and you get shocky, and a lot of swelling, and so forth. And you really, you know, you really become quite ill. Uh, so it's important that once you're sure that you've sustained a rattlesnake bite that you go where you can get some assistance. In some cases, a rattlesnake bite can be harmless if the snake fails to release venom when it strikes. Dr. Blackman says it will be obvious if any venom has been released. So you need to look at the wound and see what's happening. If it doesn't swell, if within an hour's time, after you think you've been bitten, there's no swelling, there's no bleeding around the openings, there's a very good chance you haven't been bitten. You can sit tight. In rare cases, if someone gets bitten by a rattlesnake and fails to seek immediate medical treatment, they could die. 
but this is extremely rare. Out of 45,000 snake bite cases nationwide each year, only 10 to 12 cause death. I can hear one. You hear that one? It's over here just beyond these rocks, it sounds like. So watch your step here. After studying the Great Basin yeah. rattlesnake for five years, Vince Cobb has a newfound respect for yeah, this most despised reptile. It's uh, very exciting to, to run up on rattlesnakes in the wild. Uh, it gives you a real adrenaline rush. Uh, they're nothing to fear like uh, people think they are. They're not um, trying to attack. They're not trying to bite you. You know, if you get a, an animal cornered, it is going to attack and it is going to bite you. And that's, uh, that's true for most animals. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also going to be true for rattlesnakes. But if, uh, you know, if you see a rattlesnake and you just walk on by it, it's going to go its own way and you can go yours. Anyone who shoots rattlesnakes must have a valid Idaho hunting license. There is no bag or possession limit on rattlesnakes in Idaho. Well, they're certainly, they're arguably a different sort of a beast than, than anything else traveling around out there. The rattlesnake is not the only Idaho animal that suffered as a result of human fear and ignorance. That's really true, Jack, because folklore has not been kind to the wolverine. It's been depicted as the devil itself, an evil scavenger. And even today, there's relatively little scientific knowledge about the wolverine. But a research project underway in Idaho's Sawtooth Mountains is beginning to unlock the secrets of their mysterious world. In late May, the research team tried to locate a wolverine den with two young, called kits. The objective was to capture the kits, implant them with radio transmitters, and learn about their behavior. But first, the big challenge was to find the wolverine den and locate the kits. A terribly challenging task at best. Jeff Copeland, the research leader, flew over the high peaks of the Stanley Basin to find the mother, which already had been implanted with a transmitter, and hopefully find the kits nearby. We found her at Maple, Maple Lakes Basin, uh, but we're headed over to see if all the babies are with her. Affirmative, the babies aren't with her, and she's in uh, Maple Lakes Basin. By helicopter, Copeland retraced the mother's footprints in the snow and tracked the kits to a rock slide in the seafoam basin. So it appears that, that uh, the family came into here and, and mom left. Uh, so we're just going to try to, we're going to use a um, hearing device to get down in the rocks and see if we can hear anything. Hopefully our disturbance here will cause her to want to move the kits. And, when she brings them out, then maybe we can successfully capture them. As it turned out, the crew came up empty-handed. Mother Wolverine never came back. The crew spent hours trying to find the kits by excavating a portion of the boulder field. But it turned out to be a futile exercise. The next day, Copeland and the crew got lucky. They located the mother and the two kits in an open snowfield in a high alpine basin. The Wolverine location is that's it here. You should be getting close to her now. While Copeland's assistant Sparky located the mother from a fixed wing aircraft, Copeland and his helper Beth hovered below them in a helicopter. As soon as they got a firm sighting, the two quickly landed in the snowfield and began the chase. Almost immediately, the little critters fled into the trees and tried to elude capture. Copeland tried to tackle one of them, but the animal leaped out of his grip. They continued the chase. The helicopter hovered over the trees and herded one of the kits back to the snowfield. This time, Copeland made the tackle. Where to go, and as soon as she stopped, she started to take off, and they just dove. After missing the first tackle, you I wasn't going to miss it. No, no, I had her then. And then she decided to clamp down on me instead of try to get away, and, and that gave me a chance to, to get control over her. Once the female was captured, state veterinarian Dr. Dave Hunter flew in and began surgery to implant the transmitter. Meanwhile, Copeland and his assistant Clint Long raced to find the second kit. 
Clint immediately found fresh kit tracks leading into a rock slide. And then he heard the savage growl of the young wolverine. Uh, we need a jab stick and uh, capture all and syringe ready to jab this other kit. They jabbed the young male and Clint, a tall lanky guy with long arms, tried to lift the critter out of the rocks. Good job, Clint. Copeland was jubilant. Dr. Hunter quickly started surgery on the second kit to implant the transmitter. Hunter makes the incision for the implants in a slightly different location than usual, just off to the side of the stomach to put less pressure on the wound. Meanwhile, Copeland and Beth take measurements of the animal's height, weight, and teeth, and they draw a blood sample. Once the operation is complete, the crew puts the kits into a holding cage and waits an hour or so for the anesthesia to wear off. Then it's time to release them back in the rock slide. A strong odor of musk will help their mother find the kits when she returns. Come on, big guy. Copeland is thrilled to have both kits implanted with transmitters after two intensive days of expensive overflights and searching. Well, uh, I feel an amazing amount of relief. You know, this was, this was quite an effort put together with a lot of help of a lot of people to try to make this happen. And, and I was getting to the point where I was feeling like this just might not work. Follow-up flights indicated that the mother returned to the kits by the next day. And the family is back together, traveling as a unit in the high peaks of the Cape Horn area. Copeland says the kits will provide a bounty of valuable information for the research project now in its third year. We'll be able to see uh, how long the kits stay with the mother, when, they, when do they separate from the mother and go on on their own. Uh, uh, how, do they, how will they continue to associate with each other and with, with the mother, be able to watch them grow into adulthood and establish their own home ranges, disperse from the natal area, be able, it'll just be a tremendous lot of information. Even in the early stages, Copeland says the research project has proven that more wolverines exist in the rugged mountains of central Idaho than anyone previously thought. At the present time, he is monitoring 10 animals in an area extending some 3,000 square miles. I don't think there's any question anymore as to whether there is a population or not. Um, uh, they're here. Indeed, a quick view of Copeland's radio tracking map reveals over 800 sightings of 10 to 12 different wolverines. He continues to be baffled by the tremendous distances the animals travel. It's just never ceased to amaze me how far these animals will travel in a short period of time. You know, I, the hallmark of the wolverine is probably uh, its its almost insatiable need to be on the move. They're constantly traveling. One yearling male, for example, traveled from the Soldier Mountains near Fairfield to the Yankee Fork country near Stanley, a distance of 80 miles through incredibly steep terrain in a couple of days. Then the same animal took off and went 25 miles to the Cape Horn area in a single day. By collecting wolverine scat, the research team has found that wolverines feed on mostly carrion in the winter. They also have a powerful sense of smell, and they'll dig down through six feet of snow to feed on hibernating marmots and other rodents. In the summer, they feed on mostly insects, ground-nesting birds, and vegetation. If they come on to uh, you know, a fawn deer or a calf elk, uh, they'll kill it. If, they, if the opportunity is there, but it's just not something that they, you know, they, they, don't, they don't seem to follow the wintering ungulates, you know, into winter range down onto the elk or deer winter ranges, because they're just not that good at taking down a, you know, like, like a, a mountain lion or, or a bear might be. So far then, Copeland knows that wolverines prefer the high peaks of central Idaho as their preferred habitat even though they cruise from one alpine basin to the next like we cross the street. Copeland hopes to unlock more mysteries about the Wolverine as the project continues. Well, they're certainly, they're arguably a different sort of a beast than, than anything else traveling around out there. You know, it never ceases to amaze me when I 
when I'm flying and I see a set of Wolverine tracks crossing a you know, nine or 10,000 foot peak in the middle of winter. What in the world is he doing up there? Nothing else is there. I tell you, I spent a lot of time fishing for sturgeon. It's the first time we ever caught two at once. They're Idaho's living dinosaur. We often forget that Idaho's wide variety of wildlife includes fascinating creatures that live beneath the surface of our lakes and rivers. Perhaps the most astounding of these is a dinosaur of a fish that can live to be over 100 years old. Our next story profiles the habits and habitat of the white sturgeon. Beneath these waters lurk huge sturgeon who have been cruising this stretch of the Snake River long before the sound of a jet boat bounced off the canyon walls. In fact, some of the biggest bruisers in here were probably adept at escaping from fish hooks years before most of us even learned how to bait one. Rainbow trout works well. Bass works well. Sucker, squaw fish. Well, sturgeon are the longest lived fish we have in the state, and records indicate that some of them may have exceeded over 100 years of age. Uh, we've seen fish, and actually of age fish, that were in the 50, 60, and 70 year old uh, class range. Fish and game biologists Tim Kokenauer and Ed Shriver took us along on a sturgeon adventure. We're out for the chase, but an added benefit for the scientists is the opportunity to capture and mark fish for a research study. I think you've got a fish here. Our first catch is a little one by sturgeon standards, measuring less than three feet. I'm going to work it right there. A scoot is removed from the sturgeon's left side, so if this fish were to be captured again by biologists, they'll know at a glance that it has already been injected with a pit tag or passive integrated transponder. It's a tiny computer chip that's inserted into the sturgeon's muscle. Each time this fish is caught in the future, biologists will be able to evaluate the sturgeon's health and determine its growth rate, and in this manner get a better idea of how the general population is doing. Biologists also receive three, valuable two, information three, from the free three, sturgeon three, permit three, that each angler is required to send into the Department of Fish and Game at the end of the year. Okay, he's ready. Swimming dinosaurs. Okay, we've whetted our appetite and practiced a bit, and we think we're ready, so bring on the big boys. Pump. Oh, Reel break down. It. Break it. Don't give him an inch or that fish is gone. Man, he is really running now. He's got about 100 yards of line out there in that hole. And if he wants to go through that rapid, you'll never stop him. All we can do is chase. And so it begins, a battle of wills that I'm will determine him. who's tougher, man or beast. He's coming back a little bit. I'll tell you, you got to want one of these guys. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> It's like tackling a running back, isn't it, Luke? You gotta want him. <laughs> he wants to run a little bit now. Surprising it seemed enough. each time the fish was within spitting distance of the boat, he'd get a fresh burst of energy He's and bolt, racing again for the middle of the river. He went out in that deep water. I mean, we lost 90, 95 yards of line in 40 seconds. Okay, so he's back out there in a comfortable spot. Right. We didn't know if he'd stop there or just keep moving. And uh, as long as Wayne can gain line on him, we'll stay right here. After 40 minutes, it's beginning to look like a draw, the only winner being the creeping darkness. Right around here. I'm right around here. Let him run. Finally, as dusk gives way to the gloom of night, the exhausted fish surrenders, and the long battle is over. He is brought gently alongside the boat. You doubt it? Oh, you got that tie. All right, line's free. Reel it up, Wayne. Okay. The biologists measure the fish and inject it with a pit tag. Now, if the drawn out struggle to land this sturgeon still hasn't convinced you of its power, watch this. Right here is the Oh, 
supposed to tire him out, Wayne. Perhaps this fish lost the battle with a rod and reel, but he certainly won the scuffle with our television camera. We surrender gracefully and withdraw to fight another day. And that day dawns bright, clear, and hot. Hell's Canyon, somehow the name seems appropriate. The first known reference to this spectacular gorge as Hell's Canyon was back in 1895. It was described in a history book as a place where the river winds like a serpent and the rock walls towered to such a height they almost shut out the sun. These forbidding basalt cliffs provide a secure home for the sure-footed bighorn sheep that populate the area. Down below, the lambs and ewes feed quietly, while somewhere above in the rocky crags, the big rams seek shelter from the heat. We are now back on the prowl, roaring up the river in search of the perfect sturgeon hole. Here below Hell's Canyon Dam, not much has changed from the way it looked a thousand years ago. It's the way it was naturally. Uh, we have deep pools, sturgeon-like deep pools, probably in excess of 20, 30 feet. Uh, we have good flows pretty much on a year-round basis. Water temperatures are within uh, reasonable uh, limits. Um, and in fact, it's really not disturbed by man, other than just a few recreational fishermen. These fish pretty much have it to themselves. Come on, guy, do something. <laughs> Except for us, of course, and we're about to make history. Moving up, where are you further out than yep. I am? I'll tell you, I spent a lot of time fishing for sturgeon. This is the first time we ever caught two at once. The two scientists work like a well-oiled machine, switching and ducking with a finesse and instinctive rhythm that we amateurs couldn't come close to. Five, six feet. Well, what do you think, Ollie? I think we've done it now, Stanley. <laughs> We're gonna need two ropes, Luke. You're gonna have to, a rope on each side, a rope end on each side. I don't think he wants to be in yet. Eventually, the two sturgeon, each well over five feet, are brought alongside the boat. Now, the process of evaluating and tagging sturgeon for a scientific study takes a little extra time and inevitably adds in some measure to the stress on the fish. But if you're lucky enough to hook one of these big bruisers, you can follow these simple tips, and the fish you release will swim away sound and healthy and ready to return to the battle another day. This landed this sturgeon. He was exhausted. When he came into the boat, rolled belly up. Sturgeon have a natural handle right in their mouth. Keeps the fish upside down and docile. You simply take the hook out of their mouth. If the hook is too deep, don't mess with it. Just snip the line off as close as you can. The hook will rust out very quickly. Be careful that you don't pinch the gill covers closed because that's how the fish respires. Hold him for just a few minutes while the fish rests and then cradle him right side up, making sure you don't pinch the gill plates closed and let them revive. And they'll let you know when they're ready to go. Shouldn't take sturgeon out of the water because their organs uh, aren't supported. The sturgeon actually just floats in the water and is suspended by the water and if you took the sturgeon out uh, this fish here is 100 pounds or so. Uh, it's very stressful on its internal organs, as well as removing the slime coat if you put it on the sand or the rocks. Just best to leave the fish right in the water. There is nothing quite like the feeling of battling a worthy opponent, pausing to acknowledge his power and dignity, and then gently sending him home. They're Idaho's living dinosaur. You get back here and you're away from everything else. You have to depend on each other. You have to help each other. And you know, the only trouble with that sturgeon story is it knocked the hell out of my 60-pound steelhead story I was going to tell you. Well, that sturgeon was really fun, Jack. But you know what they say about fishing stories? The longer you're retired, the better they get. Yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> well, it seems we've only had time to brush up on a handful of the fascinating creatures that share our state. But that means there's a whole world of Idaho's wildlife left to explore. And perhaps there's no finer way to conclude our best of incredible Idaho edition than to take a trip down our state's premier wilderness river. 
the middle fork of the salmon, where wildlife and wild water abound. So for Jack Hemingway and myself and our entire crew, good evening and thanks for being with us. called Middle Fork my river because it was the one I learned on. Since then I've done, you know, the Bruno, the Boise, parts of the Payette, the Grand Canyon, the Dolores, the Yampa, a lot of different rivers. And they're all neat, they're all special. But, you know, in my mind, it was this river that made me a boatman. And so, uh, I guess that's why I call it mine, although I suspect I'm not the only guy to do so. <laughs> <laughs> 